Um, so first off, we've got some learning objectives today. This is a CME event uh, for those of you that uh, want to receive credit for that. So today we'll define food insecurity and who's most affected by it. We'll identify some and note the asterisk some resources that create uh, community level nutrition security for individuals and families. Um, this is a tip of the iceberg, just a taste today along with the nutrition theme. Um, and that's not to underestimate all the great work that's not highlighted today. And then thirdly, understanding elements um, and evolving community vision in which everyone in Dane County eats healthy. Um, so uh, first off, um, I invited um, uh, Michelle and Maggie because these things do happen only in collaboration. And I've been involved in the emergency food system for about 15 years, and there's just so much I don't know. And every day I continue to learn how much I don't know. And so learning uh, from colleagues like them has been really very helpful. Um, but I'm not alone as a healthcare provider. There's several things we need to learn together. Sarah Downer and her colleagues recently suggested that clinicians get more and better education to integrate food as medicine interventions, um, as you can see here. And they also suggest we identify sustainable funding streams to ensure equitable access to this work um, and availability of those interventions to everybody in our community. So I'll cover a little bit of both today. Let's get started with some definitions. Um, my setup's a little strange here, so I'm sorry that I'll be looking at two screens periodically, but uh, food insecurity is a household level economic and social condition of limited or uncertain access to adequate food, whereas hunger is an individual level physiologic condition that we experience um, often in our patients in healthcare. Nutrition security, on the other hand, you'll hear me refer to that. I want you to become familiar with that. That exists when an individual at all times has physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences. Notice food preferences, that'll be a theme today, uh, to create an active and healthy life. And then food sovereignty, a little bit of an aside here, but that's the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, and the right to define their own food and agricultural systems. So we'll talk a little bit more about that today. So I invited Michelle and Maggie to join me today since the three of us recognize just how important community collaboration is to support the emergency food system. Some of you have seen me use this before, uh, but it's a public health model to help clarify our unique roles in four domains. First, know what about health. Second, identify where there are individual um, populations, as you can see here, at the greatest risk. And then third, in the top right there, We'll emphasize that today, collaboration with others, the who, to create this collective vision and maximize efforts. And fourth, how we implement interventions or initiatives that work across, really, across all of these four action areas for the greatest impact um, on the health and well-being for all in our community. So let's first, though, start by looking at where are the populations then at greatest risk. So millions of seniors, people with chronic illness, and communities of color are newly experiencing food insecurity, and you'll hear from Michelle and Maggie later on that. But this is really because of the economic recession from the pandemic. And uh, if you're not familiar, Feeding America's Map the Meal Gap is an annual report. We've got 2020 data here that we're looking at. And on the left, we've got insecurity rates for the overall population. And then on the right, we've got uh, kids. Um, as you can see up in North Dakota, a low at 6% is down in Jefferson County, Mississippi. There's a 7% food insecurity rate for the overall population. Kids, there are several states, one out of three kids are food insecure. Um, let's take a look a little closer here in Wisconsin. So this is 2018 map the meal gap, which is our most recent. And at that time, three years ago, we had 500,000, half a million food insecure people just in our own state alone. Considering the average meal cost in Wisconsin at that time was $2.84, we ultimately had a gap of $250 million from a food budget to be able to match what was needed for those 500,000 food insecure people. I want you to pay attention to that meal cost. We're going to reference that several times today, $2.84 in 2018. Then let's take a little closer look here at Dane County. Um, we had about 40,000 people in Dane County in 2018 who were food insecure. And then accounting for our higher cost of living in the average Dane County meal cost in 2018 of $3.29. We had a $22 million gap to meet those needs of those hungry people. Um, and it's worse, definitely, in 2021. It's estimated now, um, ballpark, and, and Michelle might have greater data on this later, but 
we now have about 60,000 people in Dane County uh, experiencing food insecurity with about one in five kids locally living in poverty here. Um, you might not have seen this before, but these are Dane County Opportunity Zones. So uh, where are the opportunities? Um, really Opportunity Zones are economically distressed communities um, defined by census tract. And there's 8,700 of these in the country. Um, and really they've experienced a lot of uh, or minimal investment, I guess, over, over decades really. And this gives you a sense where they are here in Dane County, um, several in the south and north sides of Madison and Sun Prairie. Um, and then I do want you to note on the right side there that some of these low income zones, the range of median household income in those homes is 7,500 to $28,000. That's not a lot of you know food money and housing money and transportation money. Um, that's what we're dealing with here locally. Um, we refer to these then more locally as food access improvement areas. Um, I've inserted three of our four Dane County Family Medicine Residency Clinics. I'm in one of them right now at the Verona Clinic. Um, you can see where they are here. Um, Verona Southwest, Wingrad near the Isthmus, and up on the Northeast side or Northeast Family Medicine Clinic. Um, in our UW Health Hospitals and Clinic, we use these two questions to screen our patients for food insecurity uh, within the first I'm sorry, within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. And then second, within the past 12 months, the food we bought didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. Um, if a patient responds often true or sometimes true to either question, they are considered food insecure. And although we know it's the right thing to do, turns out this screening can add to our healthcare provider burnout crisis if we don't actually have the knowledge and the capacity to know what to do when somebody uh, screens positive. So hopefully after today, you have more confidence to respond when that is the case. So high unemployment has actually led to the median um, income in several Dane County households of thirty dollars to $40,000. Um, and over 50% of our students in the Madison Metro School District qualify for free and reduced uh, meals, which should give you some sense for just how important those meal programs are for so many of our kids. Um, it was great to see schools use their bus system and, and shift to neighborhood delivery of school meals over the past year as a mechanism to continue to provide this important nutrition even when schools were closed. I keep this close by. This is the ZZ's applesauce that my kids get from Middleton and it's from Michigan. And you all hear me talk about why not using Wisconsin apples um, you know, here for our school kids. Um, so what do these kids do actually then when school's not in session? Um, you know, on weekends, they have a food for thought weekend food bag program you might be familiar with. And thanks, Bill Schwab, you pointed that out earlier to several people this last year. Provides a bag of two nutritious meals, healthy snacks, and beverages uh, each Friday during the school year. Uh, for those kids to eat over the weekend and then summer meal programs are equally important. They're offered in several locations in our area and provide up to two free meals Monday through Friday with choices of breakfast, lunch or snack. Um, and related to healthy nutrition in kids, if you haven't seen it yet, the newest NHANES data just came out. Uh, notice these are always like delayed. So this is the 2718 uh, survey data and it's one in five kids are obese and those highest uh, affected are among the black and Hispanic youth. Um, so certainly our school nutrition programs and summer meal programs are, are helpful tools to possibly reverse these trends. So I hope this slide overwhelms you. That's the intention here. Um, but what do you do when someone screens positive? It's as simple as weaving together grocery stores, farms, distributors, community centers, food pantries, policy, and more, right? Then you can just turn this simple diagram into a dot phrase and epic, put it in your visit summary, and boom, you're done, right? Maybe not that simple. So I've committed to learning a lot about this. Um, and thanks to some collaboration with the Healthy Kids Collaborative, Julie Stanley, um, Shelby Jen, Shelly Shaw, and others, I'm missing several, I'm sure. But we put this together several years ago. And to say the Dane County local food system is complex, I think is an understatement of the day. Um, so let's navigate the complexity. The first thing you should be familiar with is United Way's 211 resource. So it's a tool uh, to connect individuals and families to not only food resources in the community, but to financial support, food resources, housing, addiction, treatment, healthcare, mental health care, heating and utilities assistance. You can see the list there. Um, so in, addi in addition to the 211 like telephone line, you can also search online by zip code with your patient to look for some of these things um, with them in your office setting. 
So in addition to 211, um, we're blessed here at UW to have a really great patient resources team, navigators in our clinics, and community health workers can also help. Thanks, Jonas, to you and your colleagues for making these connections in our community. Um, and they can connect to community meals, uh, meal sites, food resources, grocery assistance, et cetera. Let's transition to a few more definitions. So what do people actually do um, to get coverage? They use SNAP, a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's federal. Food stamps is a swear word, so no longer use that. I've exited out here for that purpose. Um, this is the like federal food stamps program. Um, in Wisconsin, we call it food share, as you can see here. And then the mechanism with which you spend your food share dollars, that's through a Quest card, which is actually a plastic debit card to access food share benefits. Um, and you can use these in stores and farm markets and actually some meal sites. And then note in the bottom left there um, where you can't use these in certain circumstances, alcohol uh, included. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the steps that we've actually taken to increase these uh, food share dollars and other benefits during the pandemic. The federal COVID stimulus package signed in a law at the end of December 2020 included funds um, to increase the maximum allotments for food share recipients by 15% for six months, January through June 2021. Uh, who knows what the new administration will be and what extension of these things there might be, but just to give you a sense. Now, I'm gonna do a little math. You all know that I do math when we do presentations together, but to be able to grasp this, I wanted to talk about a family of four in Dane County. Um, so uh, the, the cost per individual meal now here in 2021 is estimated to be $3.55 per meal. So let's do some quick math for this family of four. Um, just two good meals per day adds up to $863 a month. And even with this expanded food share benefit that was recently increased by 15%, that leads up to $782. There's a mismatch. And again, that's just for two good meals per day. Keep in mind though, with that said, um, you know many of these families do have nutrition support from their schools. And then hot off the presses just this week is the CDC data brief on the right that I've included there. Um, also, NHANES data that shows fruit and vegetable consumption by income level, and it might not be a surprise to most of you, but lower income levels correlate with a significant decrease in both fruits and vegetables across the board. So, Wisconsin's one of several sites piloting on online purchasing um, with these SNAP dollars because of the pandemic. And so, the retailers included include Aldi, Amazon, and Walmart. Associated delivery charges are not covered by the SNAP dollars. And thankfully we have in Madison, as many of you know, many local delivery options from grocery stores, restaurants and others, but several communities in the country do not have those delivery options that we're blessed to have here. I don't know about you, but I have never looked more forward uh, this time of the year to brighter days and usual summer fun. Um, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to a return of the Dane County Farmers Market to the Capitol Square sometime soon. Uh, the Discover Wisconsin Farmers Market guide um, is a helpful resource for food insecure individuals to navigate farmers markets, and it's available in Spanish and as well. Um, there are a few pages, as you can see, I've highlighted some sections from it that specifically describe how food share funds can be used at markets to buy produce direct from participating vendors. So you can literally take your food share dollars and buy from vendors at markets directly. And related is the double dollars program, a dollar for dollar food share match up to $25 per market day at participating farmers markets. And uh, the extra money spent by the shoppers goes straight into the pockets of the vendors um, who get reimbursed the full value of every double dollar redeemed. Um, and similarly, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program here that I show uh, facilitates purchases of farm market produce for those uh, low-income individuals, 60 and older. And, and as you can see, that list is a long list of uh, locally grown foods. So that's, that's great news, um, great access. Some of you may have heard through the Wisconsin Partnership Program that we're blessed to have access to here at UW, um, a collaboration for Farms to Families, a partnership between REAP um, uh, Reap Food Group Roots for Change and Rooted. It provides home delivery of a, um, what we refer to as a resilience box of fresh, nutritious, uh, locally grown food to serve Madison area Latinx and indigenous families. 
Typically, routes for change is doing the screening and identifying the families. Um, excuse me, and then uh, REIT makes the connections to the locally grown food and in partnership with Rooted, uh, the Badger Rock Neighborhood Center serves as the host site for aggregating food and packing the boxes as you can see there. Um, this is also important, sticking with the theme of access to fresh produce. Um, joining the CSA actually may not be that out of reach um, for, for low income individuals. So the cost of a share just from fair share as an example, fair share CSA coalition is like $600. And so through their partner shares program, um, up to 75% assistance or $350 is actually available for those in need. Um, and Susan Veld here and colleagues, uh, many of you know Wen Jen Tan, he's out in Penn State now and, and uh, Susan is out there as well. Um, she and her colleagues have summarized the six flavors of healthcare organization um, uh, based interventions to improve access to fruits and vegetables, including cashback rebates, like I show here, health insurance rebates, um, fruit and vegetable vouchers, garden-based programs, subsidized food boxes, home delivered meals, and um, I think the, the sixth, if I remember right, is um, like collaborative programs between food pantries and clinics themselves. So we'll touch on a few of these yet today. Uh, the Wisconsin Harvest of the Month program or Wisconsin School Garden Network and Growing Together Wisconsin are just a few of several great examples that we have, um, educational programs that lead to increased consumption of healthy fruits and vegetables. Uh, primarily through exposure and hands-on experiences. So we're very lucky to have such a robust educational network here in Wisconsin that could even provide guidance, as you can see here, um, on how outdoor garden-based education could occur uh, safely during COVID-19. So transitioning from the field to the kitchen, several Verona Clinic colleagues and I teach about the importance of eating those fruits and vegetables in our Chop Chop Family Cooking Club. Uh, Melissa referred to the Badger Prairie Kitchen earlier as a beautiful place that we host these. Um, on this particular day, we were making beet slaw tacos, and despite what you might think, the kids actually loved them. Um, and to facilitate taking the skills home, we occasionally give out blenders and other kitchen uh, utensils and basics to those in need. Uh, the Prairie Kitchen Cooking Club, you can see Melissa uh, there on one of the days, provides nutrition education and social engagement for seniors. And uh, um, with that, I'll uh, transition now to Michelle and Maggie to actually talk about Second Harvest as well as Badger Prairie Needs Network in their kitchen. So with that, Michelle. Thank you, Brian, um, and thanks for having, having us here today. Um, so what do people do when the money runs out? Uh, how do people access nutritious food and produce when their food share benefits run out? They turn to food pantries, of which there are four basic types. Um, there are standalone food pantries, standalone personal essential pantries, mixed food and personal essential pantries, and mobile and pop-up pantries that often distribute a mix of food and personal essential. Um, and what is a food bank? Um, I like to describe a food bank as in a couple of different ways. One is as a matchmaker or a clearing house of multiple sources of food. From nationally sourced truckloads to locally rescued retail items, which need to be inspected, sorted, repackaged, and connected to other nonprofits or programs that help people experiencing food insecurity. Uh, we spend our time and energy on sourcing, storing, and distribution so that our partner agencies can spend their resources on direct services, which aren't always um, just distributing food. They have a lot of other services um, to help people with basic needs and self-sufficiency. I also think of us as uh, kind of a big gear in the overall food system. Uh, we're a food supply gear that helps turn all the other vital gears that help people with food insecurity, housing, health care, education, employment, transportation, and so much more. Um, uh, as a food bank, you know, sometimes people think of us just as scale. And for scale purposes, uh, from beginning, of, if you look at um, during the pandemic, from March 15th to of 2020 to uh, January 2nd, 2021, we distributed almost 16 million pounds of food. So that can give you a kind of a scale idea of, of what we do, um, but we're kind of the, the supplier um, type of, of idea here. Um, you know, 40% more people are struggling with hunger since the pandemic began. And since then, food banks have faced a perfect storm that includes surges in demand, uh, declines in food distribution donations due to supply chain challenges, fewer available volunteers, and other disruptions to the charitable food system's operating model. 
Um, so how have pantries changed during COVID-19? Several changes have occurred during the pandemic in the pantry community. Um, several positives include expanded service area boundaries, um, increased visits allowed, and some pantries are now delivering. And then there are some challenges. Uh, there are some pantries that have more limited hours or have closed altogether. Um, there's a less of an ability to receive food donations. Um, pantry guests are not allowed inside to shop. And uh, many have had to transition to drive through. And so there's less choice. Uh, you know, a pantry we've as a as a network across the, the country, um, food, pa food pantries and food banks have really moved towards this choice model where we've allowed where, where we've encouraged. Uh, our participants to be able to select the items that they want. And now when people can't come into those pantries to to do that the same way, and we've had to do a lot of prepacking due to um, to no contact distributions in many ways, uh, that choice has been limited. Um, pop up food pantries, you know, UW's health, UW Health's pop up pantry serves employees in needs in need. The drive through is located at the children's hospital entrance and both fresh and non perishable items are distributed in prepackaged boxes. Collaboration partners who provide the food include second harvest Madison area food pantry gardens and others. Unfortunately, with weather, like we've had this past week, the extended hands pop up pantry and others can't function. So now I'm going to turn it over to Maggie, who's going to share some more about about the work that they do. Um, yeah, hi, so my name is Maggie Gleason. Um, I'm the executive director at a food pantry in Verona called Badger Prairie Needs Network. Um, and yeah, like Michelle said, uh, over the last year, we have just came a huge increase in demand. So um, just a quick snapshot of our year um, last year, uh, we did in fact uh, distribute over 95 or 995,000 pounds of food um, to over 68 hundred households and uh, that included 24,600 individuals that were served um, and that's up quite a bit. Um, one of the one of the things that we saw that was really surprising was a 500 percent increase in new households. Um, you know, Michelle mentioned that we did drop our service area, so we now serve all of Dane County. Um, and so because of that, we saw a lot, a huge influx of new households. Um, one of the positives that I'd like to point out from the shutdown and, and the whole pandemic situation was the ability for the kind of the bigger food pantries in the area to kind of have a little more collaborative effort in terms of coming together and sharing ideas, which is something that we hadn't really done before. And so we kind of all decided that we wanted to drop our service areas and we are in more um, constant communication and partnership to exchange ideas and kind of bounce ideas off of each other and, and, and come up with better ways to serve the community. Um, we Another positive that came out of the pandemic for us uh, is we were able to secure some funding um, to uh, add on some cooler and freezer, freezer space. So we were able to increase our capacity to serve our community, not just directly in Verona, but also um, to other small small food pantries in the, like the rural areas of Dane County. Um, by being able to um, store more cooler and freezer uh, items for them. They don't always have enough um, capacity to store that kind of stuff. So we are able to collaborate with them and they come and um, pick up from us at, at times. And we also um, built on like a giant, it looks like a gas station a little bit, but it's a big canopy to help protect our guests um, in the drive through line and also our volunteers, which has been uh, really great, especially in this cold weather. We added on like a little outdoor vestibule. So when the wind chills are negative 15, um, we're not uh, we're still able to function and, and serve our guests, which is great. Um, so uh, we also not only are we a food pantry, but we also have a couple other different programs that we run out of our building. One of them is the Kitchen to Table Wisconsin Food Recovery Network. Um, and that program was started, I think, in, in 2019 um, with the idea that there is so much surplus food in the area that we um, wanted to find a way to um, collaborate uh, with some of the bigger companies in town. Um, Epic is one of our big partners in Promega and Fitchburg. Um, 
has started to cook for us as well, where they, um, you know, Epic has a lot of cafeterias, I think like three or four really big ones. And so they, they serve their, um, their employees, but then they have a surplus of food and they would save that food for us. And we would go and get it. We would pick it up on Fridays, bring it back to our kitchen and repackage it. And then, and then we were able to, um, to, we were able to distribute that, not just to our guests in Verona at, the, at our food pantry, but we share it with um, other food pantries in the area, small and big. So we send we send prepared food over to the river pretty regularly and to, to St. Vincent's um, a couple of times a week as well. And so uh, with that refrigerated van that's on, I guess it's on my left hand side, uh, we, we partnered, we were able to get a grant, a middle mile grant from the Walmart Foundation in partnership with Second Harvest. And um, that van allows us to safely transport the food back to our place so that we can repackage uh, it and send it out um, to other food pantries. Um, in 2020, we were able to provide 160,000 grab and go meals um, through partnerships with Epic, ProMega, and Exact Sciences. Um, and so, not only does that that partner those partnerships really help us feed uh, feed our guests and other other not just our guests but like the whole community, um, and also help us reduce food waste, which is uh, I think a critical part of the food system too. Yeah, so uh, the, I don't, I, Joe Mingle is someone that uh, is also a, someone that rescues food. Brian, can you talk more about him or Michelle? Do you know, do you work with Joe? So yeah, Joe, I mean, I, I, I refer to Joe as a warrior on the north side um, who has been in the food recovery space for a long, long time. He's just done a lot of great work, uh, but with no big conventions at the Monona Terrace, et cetera, um, there's just not a lot of pre-prepared pre food out there outside of what um, Maggie just talked about. And so he's shifted a lot of his work to a more direct uh, to door uh, delivery uh, for the food that he does have. And then he's been critical in developing several neighborhood based pop up uh, pantries that are in these already existing social networks that are so critical uh, during the time of the pandemic. Um, just on that last slide, I wanted to give a shout out to UW Health. Uh, the other refrigerated van in that picture is actually, um, I think CAC, Community Action Coalition, uses that van to, to move some food around and took quite a, bit, <laughs> quite a bit of work to get that thing donated, but that is a beautiful tool also to have in this network of food rescue. Um, let's see. So. Sorry about that back and forth here. So in addition to uh, the healthy food for all model that we just talked about there a second ago, home delivered meals are most commonly supplied to older adults um, as part of Dane County's senior nutrition program. Uh, there's actually about 29 or 30 neighborhood sites, um, but most haven't been able to serve due to COVID as you can imagine. Um, but when open, transportation is available to these sites for those who aren't homebound and for those of you healthcare providers, that's a term that we frequently think about, is somebody or is somebody not homebound to qualify for certain services. Um, it's important to also just recognize that these meals are nutritious, but they provide in and of themselves for a day, a third of the recommended daily intake for older adults. So. Um, there's still a gap and they do include protein, vegetables, fruits, grains, milks, um, and the payment basis is on a donation uh, basis. So where do home delivered meals on wheels come from uh, here in Dane County? And I apologize for those of you up in La Crosse and Milwaukee and Wausau and elsewhere. Um, I don't know a lot of details about you guys, but thanks for letting us talk a little bit about Dane County here today. Um, here from SSM Health at Home, is where the daytime delivered meals come Monday through Friday and the vegetarian or soft consistencies are available uh, for those that need those. I'm circling several prices as we go here. Um, the cost for these is about $9. Um, and again, funding for these low income individuals is available from uh, services such as Dane County Human Services, uh, SSM Health at Home Foundation, community donors um, and, and others. Um, evenings. Mark Ward at home does a similar service Monday through Friday, uh, similar costs at 840 to 910 uh, ballpark per meal. Um, and tonight, lasagna, roasted zucchini, sauteed spinach, fresh fruit, including a banana. Looks pretty good. Um, 
I'm proud of this, but I'm not proud of the fact that healthcare providers are burning out. Uh, many of us don't sleep well, we don't exercise enough, um, and, and honestly, many of us don't eat well. So my approach to um, improve staff and physician well-being was to develop a meal kit program for employees in collaboration with Mad City Chefs Care Hair Nutrition. You can think about HelloFresh, Purple Carrot, Blue Apron, but here in our backyard. Um, my family pays about eight to nine dollars per serving for these. Uh, once weekly farm fresh meals and they're conveniently dropped at the Verona clinic. So I don't have to chase around as some of you know, I've got a two physician household, three little girls, a daughter with a disability can barely keep it together most days. And we're lucky if we don't eat lucky charms. Um, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that today, but I did it publicly, I guess. Um, but not only are we buying local in these meals, we're also lifting up uh, Badger Prairie Needs Network because we prep these meals in their kitchen. We rent that space. Um, and, you know, maybe hunger care coalition can help us uh, bridge this gap where at some point we give those patients and staff in our clinics the same things that our pantry folks get and vice versa. Um, wouldn't that be a great thing? Um, so not only has it been my dream to have pantry guests and us eating the same things, but now I've got several patients eating what I eat. And it's honestly transformed uh, how I address nutrition and clinic visits for sure. Since patients thankfully have started to inquire more about healthy food and, and meal kits and less about weight loss medications. Um, so similar to other diabetes prevention programs, what this is referring to is Verona Clinic's um, Fitness and Lifestyle Challenge. You can see the website there. It's accurate as of last year because we did not do this through the pandemic. Um, but it's a group visit program that I developed with Maggie Larson, one of my colleagues here at the clinic uh, for our obese patients with uh, prediabetes or diabetes. And thankfully in the past, we've had support with group health and courts to actually um, offer active and engaged participants, 100 to $200 as part of their annual uh, wellness incentive in the past. So slightly different than the meal kit concept, but born out of the pandemic is Cook It Forward, a collaboration between downtown restaurants um, to produce restaurant quality meals, individually package them, and then deliver them to pantries and other community locations. Um, their meal cost is $10. This price allows them to actually pay the staff within their restaurants $15 an hour during a time actually when they would have been sent home or otherwise idle. Um, so when the restaurants could have been empty um, and pretty much are empty, Cook It Forward still takes advantage of that local farm supply chain, their distribution network and delivery network that they have and, and lifts those up um, in, in this model. So several donors in the community also support this mission. And then um, Little John's got a little bit famous here recently, um, but they create chef quality meals for individuals of any means, um, as well as for meal programs like the Boys and Girls Club and other nonprofits that have uh, um, uh, programs like that. The model's a little different than Cook It Forward in that they use grocery excess um, for that food that might otherwise go to landfills. And as you can see in the diagram here, uh, 25 million Americans could be fed in that regard. Um, so once their restaurant opens just up the road from us in Fitchburg off of Verona Road, diners will be able to pay um, what they can for a meal with some paying it forward uh, by paying for others. And compared to the $9 cost of Meals on Wheels, Little John's $5 meal cost is a result of this community collaboration and synergy. Um, and if you didn't learn about Morgan's Lemonade Stand and President Biden's inauguration, like good for you, Morgan. Um, she's an eight-year-old girl from Belleville just up the road here with a big heart who's already been able to raise over $50,000 for this mission. Um, and boy, that's that's pretty inspiring. Good for you, Morgan. Um, so let's, um, let's just take these local meals a step further and do something to them to medically tailor them for specific medical needs. That's basically what a medically tailored food is. So the food is medicine, um, I guess, evidence-based, if you want to call it, is growing. Um, medical uh, meals or medically tailored meals, MTM as I'm referring, uh, referring to them here, are for people that have pretty significant chronic disease and, and uh, disabilities in particular. We often in healthcare refer to those as the duly eligible, those eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. That's where the evidence base is strongest. Um, but I think the business case can be pretty simple, even for a simple uh, one track mind, like I sometimes have a single readmission when somebody gets discharged and then has to come right back $13,000. Whereas you can feed somebody with the examples that I just provided here at less than $20 a day. 
let me tell you a little bit more about the evidence on this because I think this matters to what we're talking about today. So Project Angel Heart, they're a Colorado based um, entity, looked at medical claims data for individuals with congestive heart failure, COPD and diabetes. Again, people that have fairly significant chronic disease. They use the um, Colorado All Pains All Payer Claims database. Um, they found a 13% decrease, as you can see in the top left here, in 30 day readmissions, and then further down, a 24% reduction in total costs per member per month, one that we often refer to in healthcare and insurance for those that receive these medically tailored meals. Um, similarly, community servings in Boston um, looked at outcomes using the Massachusetts All Payer Claims Database. They estimated that um, uh, as you can see here, an individual monthly healthcare savings of $753 per person per month. I'm gonna bring you a step further now and say, that's almost enough to cover through those healthcare savings. That's just about enough to cover the $782 expanded, 51% expanded monthly food share benefit. Um, so based on programs like I described, the Bipartisan um, Policy Center recently did a simulation of high-risk Medicare population with Conditions like I described here, if they had two or more of these, if they had a functional limitation as well, put them into this model and said, what would happen if these folks got fed? How many fewer ED admissions would they have? How many times would they go less to the hospital? How less frequently might they be admitted to a skilled nursing facility? Turns out they identified flashing yellow lights here that $1.57 in savings occurred for each dollar that they spent on this uh, very large um, uh, simulation that they did. So, Mom's Meals is an Iowa-based, Iowa. I don't like Iowa for a lot of reasons, sports in particular, but uh, in this case, just because of the geographic uh, differences. So, Mom's Meals is an Iowa-based medically tailored meal provider and is what some local health insurance companies offer, including our Quartz Medicare Advantage, actually. Um, and there's a $14.95 delivery fee. So, when you factor that in these work out to be about $9 per meal. And if you consider Little John's $5 per meal cost, as well as the environmental benefits of the reduced food waste, um, or you consider Cook It Forward's $10 per meal cost with simultaneously um, supporting restaurant staff, the local farmers, the distribution network, maybe, just maybe, Dane by Local, uh, maybe local programs like these uh, might be a way to offer medically tailored meals during and after the pandemic with a little bit more community collaboration and investment. Um, so here's a little more on the Quartz Medicare Advantage coverage for Mom's Meals. It's a great benefit as 20 meals are provided. That's a few more than typical actually. So at time of discharge, up to 20 meals provided and they do that up to four times per year for these Medicare Advantage plans. Four of the five actually cover that. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I think it's one of the reasons along with many others why we are a five-star uh, plan that is Quartz Medicare Advantage, and it's one of the only in the country, and they get that rating from CMS. It's it's programs like this that make that happen. And <clears throat> I don't know if Jonathan Jaffrey's on today, but our accountable care organization could likely harness, um, I'd say, even more savings with more members eating good food, right? So the outcomes using medically tailored meals are even greater when the meals come with ongoing personalized nutrition advice, a home-based transitions team, and nurses, um, and others. So I think we're close to being able to pull some of this together here in our community. Uh, the referral form is pretty straightforward. And now you know, it's just a matter of awareness. It exists. So now, you know, refer those patients uh, when it's appropriate. And again, wouldn't it be amazing to see local insurance dollars lifting up Cook It Forward, Little John's and others, um, you know, rather than an Iowa based company and their shipping, et cetera, that doesn't do anything for our neighborhood, our local economy. Um, I've been working with Quartz probably over the last six to 12 months actually to, to think through this business case um, and hopefully we'll see an added benefit maybe as soon as 2022 in Dane County uh, for the non-Medicare population to receive a benefit like this. Um, other variations on the food is medicine theme are the fruit and vegetable prescription programs and medically tailored groceries. Um, just a slight variation here in that these are used for food insecure individuals who um, have these chronic diseases, but have the ability to cook for themselves and prepare their own food. Um, Pennsylvania based Geisinger, I'm kind of giving you a little smattering of different regions in the country, but Pennsylvania based Geisinger um, has what they call a fresh food pharmacy. 
um, pretty fantastic where they uh, prescribe fruits and vegetables rather than insulin. Um, and it's led to a cost savings with an investment of about $1,000 per family per month. That return is $24,000 in healthcare savings per family per month. Silence, I feel like I could drop the mic on that one. That's pretty impressive. Um, we had a small fruit and vegetable prescription pilot several years ago out at the Northeast uh, Clinic in partnership with the City of Madison, uh, Wholesome Wave, as you can see here, um, in the Willie Street Co-op. And assuming this evidence base remains strong, which actually it needs more work, it needs randomized controlled trials, et cetera, but assuming it remains strong and the evidence does evolve, I honestly feel we should keep investing and refining these programs locally. I continue to advocate, uh, Mary Pack, if you're on today, that our insurance companies should spend more on um, these prescriptions than insulin in the future. So let's let's try to do that someday. Which clinic lobby do you think patients associate more with whole health? The Verona Clinic on the top left or the bottom right? Practically speaking, we might um, not be able to put fresh food pharmacies in all of our clinics around town. But maybe we could install farmer's fridge vending machines in our lobbies to facilitate distribution of this food um, to individuals of any means. We also need to continue to make hospital meals and cafeteria food healthy and attractive uh, while simultaneously lifting up our local producers. I, I give UW a lot of credit. They consistently are looking for opportunities to do that. So thanks culinary nutrition partners if you're on today. Um, and if you weren't already aware, we actually do have a critical access pantry at UW. I forgot to mention that earlier, um, but that's for some of our patients at the time of hospital discharge who are identified with those certain high risk conditions, and we can give them a couple of days worth of food when they leave the hospital. Getting close to the end here. So before we wrap up, I wanna share what the Madison Area Food Pantry Gardens has been up to during the pandemic. Melissa mentioned um, I've been involved probably about 15 years as a volunteer with my family and I serve on the board as um, the volunteer development director. And as a nonprofit, we have grown and gleaned over 2 million pounds of fresh produce for the Dane County Emergency Food System. Um, and that's primarily in this uh, network of uh, several gardens, as you can see here in Madison over the past 21 years. We usually have about 700 volunteers a year. And uh, on the bottom right here, you might recognize some of those faces working in the Verona Clinic uh, garden, the little garden that could, that grows generally about 1,200 pounds of tomatillo and other culturally appropriate produce for the Badger Prairie Needs Network each year. Um, <clears throat> we uh, have really great relationships with several pantries and other food programs in the community. Um, and in 2020, we distributed to uh, 19 different programs, 84,000 pounds of this fresh, culturally relevant uh, produce. Um, and in 2021, we expect to contribute up to 23 different uh, programs. And we'll add, what do we have here? Bethel Lutheran Church downtown, Cook It Forward, Little John's. Um, and through our expanded footprint <clears throat> out at Forward Garden at the uh, uh, Hope Farm Homestead in the town of Middleton will be adding about three to five acres in production this year. So hopefully up to 125,000 pounds of food will contribute. Um, sorry. Uh, so in order to offer, um, I can't remember if it was Maggie or Michelle earlier, but these single serving things, you know, are really real this year in, in the distribution network. And so in order to offer single serving produce to match these distribution needs of our pantry partners during the pandemic, we put together about 800 steamer bags of broccoli, cauliflower, and green beans, um, thanks to many community partners who worked together to support this uh, effort and included uh, Chef Kara, I don't know if you're on today, from Promega and her team, um, the culinary team there. Um, packing skills, as you can see in the top right with our UW Health Dietetics interns. Um, there we were at the Lusher Food Pantry uh, packing. In the middle here is my daughter, Alexa, who has Down syndrome and she was, uh, actually applying bilingual steamer bag labels during a virtual OT session uh, via Zoom this year. I was so proud of her. Um, but with the right setup and support, individuals with many different um, abilities can obviously contribute to efforts like these. So as part of our community needs assessment, our farm manager just distributed a produce preference survey I developed with input from several of you on the line today, several community partners. We're asking pantry guests um, directly, actually, along with the pantry produce, uh, produce managers and other uh, leaders there to select what fruits and vegetables they would like to receive in the future and in what form this age of several. Um, it's also available in Spanish and the Hmong community has provided uh, uh, regular feedback on this as well. Um, but not only will it influence what we continue to grow, but it's going to guide our steps in 
collaboration with several of those community partners I've alluded to here earlier who can cut it, they can bag it, they can bunch it and more. So Second Harvest is also going to use these results to inform their um, season's plantings from some of the farms that they buy some of their produce from. And as Maggie alluded to, they got that significant right. grant to uh, um, uh, expand their refrigeration space. Refrigeration in the emergency food system is minimal um, and there's just definitely not enough. And it's partly what explains why we have 40% of the US food supply um, going to landfills rather than helping those in need. Um, most of our Madison area food pantry gardens produce gets to pantry guests within 24 hours of when we harvest it. And occasionally we'll hang on to it for a day or two because of the pantry distribution limitations we've already described today and their hours restrictions, et cetera. But um, as several of you know, my, my uh, gearhead or my mechanical engineering degree sometimes comes in handy. And this past summer, um, I helped design and build a walk-in cooler at Forward Garden, which is those 12 acres I referred to earlier. And although the cooler is in this dilapidated uh, machine shed, it keeps our produce ultra fresh for our pantry partners using a simple window air conditioner and a fancy controller I found out in California from a company that forces it to go colder than it's supposed to. So pretty excited that next comes solar power to take it off the grid. Just about done here today, guys. Thanks for keeping with us. Um, looking to the future, we're gonna improve accessibility at our gardens. We'll be adding some raised beds. Hopefully we'll get some of these track chairs, at least one of them from Accessibility Wisconsin, which is a nonprofit over in McFarland. Um, and with continued innovation and collaboration, I'm grateful to the partners who have stepped forward to think about with us, including some of my engineering colleagues, how we might have some year round growing capacity. It's great that we submit you know, to the food pantry system what we do, but that's primarily uh, May through November. What would it look like if we did it all year round? And so on the right is a vertical hydroponic system designed by an engineer out in Singapore. Um, and then we also though have really excellent expertise in Wisconsin. We've got Superior Fresh um, up by uh, Black River Falls. We've got um, some awesome research going on over in um, uh, Nelson and Pate and Stevens Point, um, Chris, the professor up there, they're looking at how they can put walleye into the hydroponics or the aquaponics system. Superior Fresh uses salmon. I don't know of an emergency food system in the country that uh, supplies these or those fish, um, but maybe we're not that far from doing it here in Dane County. One more slide to overwhelm you with here. So Dane County Eats Healthy is an evolving collective vision that I've developed um, over the last several months, maybe even the last several years actually, that relies on community collaboration to increase the emergency food system's less, uh, fresh local produce supply, lightly process it and distribute it with these coordinated transportation logistics. As healthcare providers, providers um, like us that are trained to work in public health models like this, I challenge you to get involved in at least one of the spokes around this wheel that support this central mission. Um, the wheel can't turn without everybody working together. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide. You can take, take a look at this one later because I'd rather focus on this. So if you're like me, you probably stopped um, seeking daily news with all the negative press lately. Um, but I did wanna share you uh, this piece that I saw on Monday in Madison.com. So this is uh, Ellie and her daughter Zaya that live up in Oregon, just up the road from us here. And here they're in their front porch talking about their food pantry they've set up. So you can think of this definitely as a pop-up. In their front porch, uh, they've got boxes um, from this past summer that they basically started with that now have transitioned into this mini grocery store. Every day, 6.30 a.m., they flip on the lights, unlock the door, close it down at 9.30 at night. Um, people can come and grab what they need. They serve about 10 to 12 people each week out of their front porch. If that's not inspiring, I don't know what is. Um, it's gonna take all this and a whole lot more to support these 60,000 people we just described here in Dane County. And although this, um, I don't know what you want to call it, but a long collaboration chain maybe, um, at the end of this is uh, a supply of healthy food delivered with, uh, with dignity to those in need. And a vision that Dane County Eats Healthy is truly cultivating the Wisconsin idea and greater things are going to be done yet in this city. So thanks everybody for listening in. We can probably spend some time on some questions, Melissa. Yeah, so thank you all so much. Uh, very inspiring. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, if you, you want to put questions in the chat, uh, yeah, feel, to, feel free to do that now. Uh, we'll start with a question. <clears throat> you touched on it a little bit, you and, and both Maggie 
But in terms of the how food waste uh, plays into this discussion, <clears throat> maybe if you could touch um, Mandy a little bit more just on the complexity and all of what's been involved in the partnerships, uh, such as with Epic, then it, it does sound like a very easy thing to do, but uh, in reality, it's pretty complex. Yeah, absolutely. Um what one of the things that we are able to do and i'm not even sure because uh, this this relationship at epic predates uh, my time at, at badger fire needs network but um we are able it used to be before we closed down we were able to drive over to epic and and just pick up the food that they otherwise maybe would have had to toss out into the garbage um and and we they freeze it for us and we bring it back and, and we're able to take it into our commercial kitchen and because we're a licensed facility like a licensed commercial kitchen we're able to repackage that food into um you know because it comes to us in big you know serving trays um and so it's a little bit unwieldy to uh to give to a family they don't want a big lasagna pan right we kind of divvy it up into smaller um smaller portions so that we can give it to individuals, especially seniors and um, those that maybe don't have the ability to cook for themselves. Um, so we try and give them uh, a little bit smaller portions to be able to um, just heat and eat. It makes it really easy. Um, and and so that's that's how we save that food from going into the landfill, which is, it's great. And, <clears throat> Ryan, um, Ryan does had another question. Uh, what's the best way to equip slash mobilize others to help in this? Wow, big question. Um, I can speak for the Madison Area Food Pantry Gardens. I was really grateful for order number 13, where we can have um, up to 150 gather outdoors now, which is fantastic. We were limited this last year, actually, uh, with 25 to 50 people. Um, and so in that regard that's a great way obviously um what i hoped to be able to provide today is if you had one dollar where might you commit it you know and who might you lift up if you wanted to provide finances besides your volunteer time and then you know thirdly i think um we all have a cognitive load up there that we can offer ideas um i saw lou sander you were saying hey why not ge geothermal uh to do year-round hydroponics like iceland yeah, it's out there, and why aren't we doing those things here? So I think the more we can um, uh, collaborate and create synergy out of, particularly in Dane County, I mean, we are so blessed with resource. It's just a matter of putting the teeth and the gears together to mesh so that the wheels can turn. Um, and so you know, I think several people always have great ideas, and they're just reluctant to bring them up because – uh, maybe they're too big or maybe they're impossible, but uh, I think we're proving that we're beyond that here in Dane County. I would also say that, um, you know, volunteering is still something that uh, that we need. Um, I'm I'm I don't I Maggie can speak to what they need as well. Um, we um, at Second Harvest, we have three locations. We have a, lo a location in Stoughton. We are at the Lion Energy Center and we're here. Um, on Dairy Drive in Madison, and we um, we have a lot of work to do. We do a lot of prepacking, a lot of sorting. I mean, we're we're um, we're dealing with lots of food and a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and we are able to do it safely. Um, we 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 do it socially distanced. We um, we have a lot of um, parameters, you know, masking and. And temperature checks everything, um, and we um, we we have a lot of work that needs to get done in order to get the food uh, ready to go before it goes out to our partner agencies and to our mobile pantry. So um, uh, we we would love to have more help to get to get that food ready to go. There's information on our website about that. Um, and you know the um, another point about about food waste is that um, you know there's a lot of food out there that that is good beyond its dates and we have to move it really quickly and it's it's one of the challenges that has come up uh, lately in in food rescue and food recovery is that prepared foods and things like when like the, the items that we're getting they have to go out really quickly and doing a lot of prepackaged items it's it's challenging to move some of that food that we used to be able to do in kind of a choice model because we're getting it and trying to pre-pack those boxes without um, knowing who's going to get that box, it can it can be challenging. But 
there's, you know, on a national level, we're doing a lot of food rescue as well. And so as a network, um, uh, you know, I think I think people think a lot of food about food waste on the restaurant level. And I think that's some of the hardest to do. And I'm so glad that that um, Badger Prairie Needs Network is doing that on like the the, um, the the level that that's one of the hardest types of foods to 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 recover and that that um, that that work that they're doing to 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 recover that kind of food is, is amazing. Um, we're also doing this um, national, you know, nationally, there are there are truckloads of produce that just aren't going to get to where they need to go. And we're bringing in those truckloads as well. Second Harvest dealt with about 12 million pounds of food last year that would otherwise go to waste. Um, and that, some of that's on a national level as part of the Feeding America Network. So food waste happens on all sorts of levels. And keep in mind that not all the food that's wasted in the United States is recoverable. And we 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 handle as a network a lot of things that we can't distribute. And so when people talk about zero waste and 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 things, um, we're not able to be zero waste ourselves because we have a, such a vulnerable population that we serve. The people we serve are often more susceptible to foodborne illness because of their age, their their health, the amount of nutritious food they get on a regular basis. And we we have to be really careful about the types of food, distressed food. We get food that that has you know not been labeled properly, and we we do have to err on the side of caution. And so the food. I smell the milk at home and I'm like, oh, it smells fine. But here we can't do that. We have to be pretty careful and cautious so that we can protect the people that we're serving. So um, there are some things that it breaks our hearts. We can't distribute and we know we have to, to discard some things, but we want to be extra careful about protecting the people that we're serving, even if we can extend some dates on things. It's challenging and it's heartbreaking on some of the things that we're that. But yeah, it's we, we have to be pretty careful on things. Thank you. I think um, <clears throat> with time, we have uh, time for one uh, more question, and this is from uh, Jonas Lee. Um, of course, amazing work. Are there any restaurants in low income neighborhoods that are being supported? Uh, thinking about culturally appropriate food, I could see some of these ideas as being very foreign to some of our low income patients. Jonas, I can't answer that question specifically other than I can say, for example, one of the distribution locations that uh, Cook It Forward would distribute to would be like Kennedy Heights Neighborhood Center, uh, Baby Foundation, and other sites that are um, not traditional restaurants, but uh, traditional community uh, locations that people would relate to and be more comfortable with right within their neighborhoods. And so I think the idea is bringing something that's a little bit uncomfortable to a comfortable place. Um, is kind of the idea here. And I think the three of us on presenting today, as well as others that we work with, you know, it's all about dignity. It's all about cultural relevance. It's all about trying to do what's right for everybody and that there should be no haves, there should be no have nots. We together, you know, sort of need to uh, roll in the same direction on making this a very normal situation to have good food. So that's a great question, Jonas, and I'd like to continue to work with you to discover a little bit more about the communities particularly that you serve. 